who will be joining as we go along. But good afternoon. Oh, thank you for that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, just a little introduction before we start. This event is sponsored by the Orchid Global Participation Fund, and it is organized by Ubuntu Net Alliance and Access to Perspectives as uh, the managers and the founders of Africa Archive, respectively. Uh, for the sake of those maybe who are new to the space, Africa Archive is an open access repository for African research output. Yeah, it is, um, it is a platform where African researchers can share their research output, including preprints, uh, conference papers and posters, scholarly works uh, across multiple disciplines. Uh, yeah, through the management of Ubuntu Net Alliance, we hope that we can align the platform perfectly or, or at least as close as possible to African researchers' needs um, managing the Africa Archive uh, platform. Uh, additionally, uh, the aim is to provide a solution that you know makes it possible for African research to also be uh, to also reside on the African continent. Uh, so that's a, that's a good option to have now that Ubuntu Alliance manages the platform and hosts the platform that is also now possible. Um, so maybe just to get a feel of what uh, what I just talked about, Africa Archive and also the Africa Archive uh, repository itself, which is uh, still in its development phase, but then, you know, the integrations of uh, persistent identifiers such as ORCID, such as DOIs is, have already been made and, you know, soon it will go public to the extent that uh, individuals, individual researchers and institutions can also create their repositories on it. But to get a feel, uh, can I ask uh, Ebuka if you can just share the links in the in the chat uh, so that people can get a feel of of the Africa Archive repository and also uh, the the website itself. Yes. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. I will. Yes. Thank you very much. So today's webinar is part of a webinar series that is being carried out to expose African researchers to how selected scholarly services work to increase the discover the discoverability of African research in the global scholarly landscape. So this will be achieved by focusing on the transformative impact of persistent identifiers, which serve to, uh, which serve as unique and enjoying labels assigned to digital objects. You know, these include resources, entities, and what have you. Uh, just as well, uh, persistent identifiers uh, can also be assigned to individual researchers. That's the case with ORCID. Uh, or ORC ID, and, and also they can be assigned to research institutions, which is the case for uh, ROR, ROR. So in this webinar, we shall focus on the topic, enabling global reach and discoverability of African research data. Uh, my name is Harold Boa. I am the Business Development Officer at Ubuntu Net Alliance, uh, and I will be the moderator. So without further ado, uh, Let's meet our speakers who shall help us interrogate the topic, which I just mentioned. Uh, they are both from Figshare, which I am sure they will be able to introduce far much better than I ever would. Uh, so yes, without further ado, we have Mark Hanel, who is the founder of Figshare, uh, which, is cre which, which he created uh, whilst completing his PhD in stem cell biology at Imperial College in London. Uh, Fixture currently provides research uh, data infrastructure and for institutions, publishers, and uh, funders globally. Globally, he is passionate about open science and the potential it has to revolutionize the research community. Uh, it's 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 a pleasure to have you, uh, Mark. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, a former academic librarian and currently part, uh, currently partnership development manager at Fixture, who is Maria Cotera. Um, she supports open science and is responsible. I mean, open science and responsible research by developing strategic relationships, which uh, bring Fixture's data and international repositories to universities and research institutions across Africa. Uh, also the Middle East, Southern and Eastern Europe as well. Uh, and likewise, we're also very happy to have you here, uh, Maria. So yes, with that being said, uh, thank Mark. Uh, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harold. Thank you everybody for joining. I am gonna share my screen and hopefully everything will be working wonderfully. 
Looks like it is. Um, thank you very much. I will be talking and then Maria will be talking. Um, and we're going to try and keep it entertaining, uh, keep it interesting. Um, research data is a new thing in the academic space. I mean, it's, it's not new in the sense that researchers have been generating data for a long time, but the tools being available, available in order to publish this data and publish all different types of content um, are relatively new. Uh, so new, in fact, that when I was uh, finishing up my PhD, I decided to build a tool because uh, I couldn't find one elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to start with that. As I say, I'll try and keep it entertaining uh, in the form of a story. Um, how Figshare got started, it's, it's all I know how to talk about. So I, I'll, I'll talk from the Figshare perspective. But then we can talk more about uh, repositories as a core service to enable discoverability. Uh, Figshare's initiatives in Africa, our integrations with PIDs and built-in integrations, and what, what the future looks like, right? So why should you care? Why is this important? What, it, what, what are you going to take away from this, uh, this presentation today? And I think um, there is a lot of different things that academics have to be thinking about now. Uh, the move to open, open access, open data, do I need an orchid? Do I do it? What are all these acronyms and and who's going to help me do it? And I think the library world is very powerful in that space. I think that is where a lot of the expertise lives. Um, so let's crack on and see how we go. So as I mentioned, I um I did as Harold mentioned for me, I did my PhD in stem cell biology, and during that time, um. I had a lot of files that I generated that were videos of stem cells moving from one side of the screen to the other. And so when I wrote a paper, I'd say, as you can see in the video, the stem cell, the red stem cells move faster than the blue stem cells, right? I was trying to get them to move. Um, and I went to publish this paper and they said, sorry, we don't accept video files as part of the publication. And I was disappointed for two reasons. One, um, I would then have to write all of these paragraphs of text saying the red cells are moving at this speed and the blue cells are moving. Whereas if you could just play the video, you could see that. And the other thing that annoyed me was I'd spent my whole weekend making these videos and they just were never going to get shared anywhere. So um, I was a hacky coder at best and I thought, why don't I just start publishing these videos and data sets and all of this other stuff from my research that uh, doesn't We'll, we'll never see the light of day, you know, and someone's paid for that research. It should it should be made available. Um, so this was the first version of Figshare that I built. I, I made it for myself and then I opened it up to allow other people to upload content. As you can see, I'm not a designer. I've had a lot of um, people say to me since that uh, my color scheme was pretty, pretty uh, tough on the eyes. But, you know, publish all your data. Um, try and make all of your research outputs available. So I, I was able to publish my five megabyte uh, data set. As I said, I um, I started, opened it up to other people and um, we got some investment from digital science and allowed us to build out this infrastructure. And more importantly, I could hire professional developers to build the platform uh, to allow more people to make their data openly available. So we have this platform uh, Figshare.com is a free platform where anyone can come along, upload their files, add some metadata and publish it. And just like you can do it for data sets, you can do it for videos, you can do it for posters, you can do it for presentations. Like this one will be made available through the Afri Africa Africa Archive, uh, which runs Figshare infrastructure. And um, what it the what it was was right place, right time. A lot of the funders globally are saying you should be making all of your research outputs available. A lot of the um, researchers are struggling with this idea of why can't I make all of my research outputs available? And I, it also had this, this concept that the publication is the king or queen. The publication is always going to be the context around the research. But it used to be that you have a publication and then you have all of these things hanging off it. Right. And as I said, I couldn't publish my videos with my publication. So uh, I, I wanted uh, I think the new world looks like this. You have a graph of research outputs out there where 
you can pull on one of these things and I can pull on a researcher and see what grants they got, what institution they're at. And this requires these identifiers. This requires a lot of plumbing in the back ends. And um, what we want to do for researchers is keep it super simple to make their data available because not all researchers want to make their data available. You know, it takes time. Um, it's new. I'm already really busy. Um, so we take care of a lot of the boring stuff, I like to say, the the plugging in and, and, and ticking all the boxes. Will this data always persist? Yes, this data will always persist. But um, one of the things we realized very quickly is it's great to have a free offering that anybody can use. But at the same time, we have a lot of globally you have different research environments. You have different people around the world who act in different ways. So I'm in the UK and my funding requirement might be different to uh, someone in Asia or someone in Africa. And what we found was consistent is that um, research organizations want their data on their home soil. They want that data sovereignty. They want to have uh, a research infrastructure that just works. They are in control of, they are the super administrator and it plugs into storage on their country. Some countries have it as a law. Some countries just think it's good for their research. And this was something that we were able to do. So um, we built out these repositories in order to um, work with institutions where it's a good fit. If you are an organization that has a lot of developers, you might want to build something yourself. There's a lot of great open source tools out there. Um, just like for the free fig share, there's also Zenodo um, or Mendeley Data, other data repositories that you can make your data available for free. Um, but we saw that it was a good fit where we say the space is moving fast. We will make a thing that's funder compliant for your particular context where you are. Um, and don't let my developers hear me saying that, it's, uh, that we do we do all the boring things because we do some fun things too. You know, we try and encourage researchers to make their data available. One of the ways we do that is whatever format you put your researches in, you can publish it through an infrastructure like Figshare. We accept any file format. We aim to preview it in the browser. And so this is a great example of a spinny molecule, which, you know, my old PI, if you asked her, uh, my old professor, if you asked her, to publish her paper and then the paper says yes and convert all of your images into png files uh, for your supplementary material she just wouldn't submit them because it was too much of a, a burden so we want to meet researchers where they are as we say we're trying to get researchers to make their data openly available in a way that gets our tagline is get credit for all of your research so we want researchers to get credits for all of the outputs that they're generating not just the papers here are some of the boring but important bits. So we are um, WCAG compliant. That means that if you are uh, blind, you can use the platform still and it, it, it ticks all of those boxes. Um, we plug into different infrastructures around the world. And when I say we want to work with the local context, it really depends who we're working with on at the different country level. So in South Africa, we work with 16 different universities um, and we plug into the national billing system called Tenet. So they handle all of that. But we also plug into the national single sign on system. So researchers can come along to their university data repository and make their data openly available. There's a lot of things in there. Data publishing might be new to you. You might be wondering why you should get your researchers to do it. Well, it's good for a few reasons. Um, impact for them and their careers is one of them, but also it's for uh, the impact of the, the research from your institution. So if uh, there's a study that came out saying, if you make your data available at the same time you publish your papers, it's associated in a 20% increase to citations to the paper. So it's really good for everybody if you make your data openly available. And then for people like me, who uh, are no longer at an institution, no longer have access to everything, 
if it's all open, if it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, I can find that research. I can build on top of it. My mum can find that research and understand different topics as well. So it's it's a win-win situation. And in order to make this scale, you think of it as there's there's two sides to it. There is the technology side to it and the people side to it. And the people side to it is all very much local context. If I go to my library, I want to speak to somebody um, in my library who understands about this. I don't want to speak to some tech team somewhere. And so we really just handle the technology and uh, we rely on working with communities to in order to, uh, to get that win-win of humans and machines um, making the best possible outcome. So this is some of the stuff that we take on in doing that. So one thing we do recently is, uh, sorry, for the last eight years we've been doing this, is we try and understand why researchers would make their data available and can we help them, can we help to encourage making their data available? So we do a thing called the State of Open Data every year. It is a survey, a global survey we do in partnership with Spring and Nature. Um, and this is some of the information from the 2023 study. So I can tell you about all of the benefits of making data openly available. The researcher benefits, they get more credit. We track uh, views, downloads, citations. So they can get track all of their impact for all of their research outputs. Um, but also, um, there is an understanding that it's new and I need some help. And what's really interesting about the survey this year, if you look at the data over the last four years, it's really been an uptick in what areas, if any, do you feel you need help with in regard to making your research data openly available? Understanding what copyright or license to make my data available has always been up there. Finding the time to manage my data is a growing thing understanding data management policies. So this is where I say the people are really important. You can go to the freefigshare.com and make your data openly available. But because it's free, because we um, do not have, it's not financially, it doesn't make financial sense for us to have a support team. We'd go, we'd go out of business for um, helping people curate their data, add the right metadata, the sweet spot is if you have infrastructure, um, there's other infrastructures, like I say, like DSpace or lots of different types of infrastructure and the people involved who are the experts in the local context. So you may know the data management policies for your local funders. Do your funders say that researchers have to make their data available? If they do, um, the researchers need help. They don't know this. And finding the time is always going to be a problem. So um, it's good to be aware of what is happening. What is really interesting is if you look at the open, how open people are to being open with their research. So there's four different things here. There is making research articles open access should be common scholarly practice. Making research data should be open. Making peer review open and publishing a preprint. And what you can see is it doesn't matter what the subject is. They all follow this pattern that the majority of people say that research papers should be open and then they think it's data and then they think it's peer review and then they think it's preprints. But I think we'll see this wave of a year from now, 80% will think data, 60% will think um, peer review should be open. And what's really interesting about this is, as you can see in this, there's some differences between the communities so these are different subjects so there is a slight difference in between uh, business researchers and arts and humanities researchers in their thoughts but we've also just recently done some data reanalysis with a group from king's college london uh, with some graduates and they started looking at the countries and the different themes for the different countries and what you find is that africa is much more open to open Perhaps you have more insight into why this is than I do, but you have countries like Japan, which are less open to open. And in fact, in a lot of the charts that we looked at, Ethiopia comes out on top as the most open to open uh, country that there is. And so I think it's a, an enormous opportunity for 
African research to jump on this open uh, open research uh, movement because it's fair for everybody. Everybody gets to reuse all of the information that's published. You can work with organizations like ourselves or like others to ensure that they, you, it's, uh, you're ticking all the boxes around data compliance and, and everything else in your country. And when we look ask those same researchers, who do you go to for help in publishing your data? 41% said publishers and 38% relied on their institution. So if you are at an institution, you're likely to have researchers come to you as the experts. The reason why they go to publishers is because a lot of people don't think about data publishing until the point at which uh, they go to publish their paper. So if you public it, publish a paper in, say, Claws Public Library of Science, when you go to publish your paper, they say, do you have any data available? You need to make it available. Do you have any data with this paper? You need to publish it. And people don't know what that means. So what does that mean? Where do I publish my paper? And so if your institution has a repository that can help researchers make their data available, it means uploading a file, giving it a title, giving it a description, clicking publish, it generates a DOI, and now that is part of the scholarly literature and it's trackable and citable and you you can get double the impact because you have a paper and a data set. Um, I'd love to see more researchers going to their institution, but it is interesting that these are the two places that they go. So you may have heard me mention before this idea of uh, FAIR data. So this is a great one because FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And why that's important is if you think about the funders around the world, they say, you we're going to give you some money and you have to publish some papers because we want to see what you did with the money. We want to see your research. We want to move the space forward. And then um, the biggest return on investment, the biggest return on investment for them right now is to say, hey, you, you create all this other stuff, preprints, presentations, posters, data sets, all of these other things. We paid for that as well to be to be that research to be done. Wouldn't it be great if you could make that openly available? And now what they're hoping with the dawn of machine learning, AI, is that we can build on top of the research and move further faster by making data openly available and having uh, the data be available for both human consumption and for the machines. So if you have machines that can read all of the data sets and say, uh, I understand the metadata, then that makes it um, a great, potentially huge uh, return on investment for the funders and return on investment for the, uh, the country or the organization from which this research is coming from. And so this is where I say about the, the people side of things. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. I like to think with a free bigshare.com or Zenodo or any other repository, if you have some data sets and you put it in the repository, it's usually findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for the humans, but maybe just findable and accessible for the machines. Uh, the robots don't necessarily know that it's been linked from a paper. And so I might be reading a paper, see there's a data set available, it's described well in the paper, but the robot might just find the data set and say, I don't know what I'm looking at here. It's not well described enough. And this is where you need technology and infrastructure as well as people. In this case, I think librarians, uh, subject expertise, and that is if you have data sets, some infrastructure, and some people to help hold the hands of the researchers, you can get findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data for both humans and for machines. So this is why um, when we build repositories, this is University of Lincoln, you can see that we have uh, the ability to deposit research or deposit data into the university repository. So this is fantastic for researchers who are looking for a trusted home and so repositories, if you have one at your university, you should try opening it up for data. You should try opening it up for all these other research outputs, allow the researchers to have more impact, to get more credit, to advance their career, 
And it's also great for you as a university because you have all of this stuff coming out of your university that you're controlling the release of. Um, when I mentioned the different types of content, we started off being data repositories, but then universities, as I say, researchers generate all different types of content. So this is Latrobe in Australia, and you can see they have open data, open educational resources, uh, open galleries, libraries, museums, uh, open publications, and open theses and dissertations. So they are controlling everything that comes out of the university. They have a copy of everything, and their researchers are getting credit for all of the different things they're making available. Um, institutions produce a lot of content. Uh, we also have started looking, working with different uh, groups to see how things can uh, work well together. As I mentioned, 16 universities in uh, South Africa use Figshare infrastructure. So what we did there was we just added a layer on top and said anything that's published in these 16 repositories will also just show up in this uh, southafrica.figshare.com. And so you have a, all of the research coming out of South Africa is in one place. You can search through it. It's got full text search. You can make it discoverable in many different ways because there is a lot of content coming out. If you look at this um, on the left, it's showing the different types of research that's being published. And if you look at the right, this is showing you, you know, newer things like data sets and preprints. That's just the top of this chart, right? It's a small amount. But back in the year 2000, there was less than 2 million academic outputs a year. Now there's more than 9 million academic outputs a year, of which 2 million of them are data sets and preprints. So it really is a great time for organizations to get hold of their content. That's what repositories can be good for. If you don't have a repository, you should get a repository at your organization to be in control. We've seen what's happened in the past with academic publishers and, and how they... Um, publish your content, make you buy it back, things like this. Universities can be in control of their research outputs, control the level of openness, and dictate um, what's happening with the outputs they produce. Something that's really interesting is um, it's really fantastic. In around 2017, we saw that the amount of open access publishes, pub publications was more than the closed access publications, which I love. As I say, I'm not at a university, so I can't read all of this content. Um, but because it's open access, I can. And what I'd like to see more of is gold open access is where you pay to publish and green open access is the same thing. It's open to everybody, but it's open by me making a copy available of that paper in my, uh, in my institutional repository. And you can see there's a lot more gold open access than green open access. I really think repositories can help us uh, make a much more equitable way of making uh, papers openly available. So we are part of a bigger ecosystem. Uh, we do plug into lots of different machines and, and types of uh, things within your institution. If you have five different systems, we have APIs, we can plug into them. But my, my colleague Maria is now going to talk about some of this from uh, the African setting. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Mark. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Uh, please tell me. I see, it. I see it. So you're take it away. Okay, brilliant. So thank you, everybody. Um, I think we have heard a lot from Mark as well. And one of the things that he's mentioned and that we know already is that there is a lot of content out there. So we have looked on some of the trends in African research. And looking at the overall African publication production, according to WIPO, that's the World Intellectual Property Organization, we can identify science and technology clusters in areas by looking at things like high density of inventions and scientific authors, uh, patent filling activity, and publication of scientific articles. That's how most of us look at activity. So we know that there has been a significant growth in the number of publications with an African affiliation in recent years. In the last decade, the, pu the publication growth has more than tripled. And you can see that on the first table here. 
how the graph uh, is going up and up. And if we look into the research of focus in African papers, the top line, that's the yellowish color there uh, in the second graph, is biomedical and clinical sciences, even more so in the past three years or so. And obviously a lot of that is due to COVID research, uh, but then that's followed by engineering, that's the green dots, which research uh, has steadily been growing as well. The production has gone up by 50% in the past five years, followed by clinical sciences in purple. So if we look at the acceleration of open science in Africa, it's very important um, to note that African researchers, and Mark has already mentioned that, are really, really uh, involving themselves with open even though there might be some regional differences in between the North and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and here we can see, and the main point that I want to main is from 2018, the blue line shows that all open access publications um, are start, start surpassing the closed publications, and this keeps growing. So from 2018 onwards, it's going to be growing, it keeps growing as a much higher um, rate and is surpassing close overall. So what does that tell us? Well, that tell us that we need to rely on systems to work uh, with us. And repositories are pillars of the FAIR principles. Fixer supports open access and open science by providing researchers, universities, etc., with an open open platform to showcase Oops. To share, showcase, and preserve research data, enabling global reach, and to make research outputs discoverable in a findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable way, the fair that Mark had been referring to. So I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the initiatives that we've been doing in Africa in the last few years. Um, this is our global reach, and I have put global in. In, in a small letters, because as you can see in the Global South, uh, we still have um, quite a few little dots, but not enough, mainly in South Africa. And uh, Mark had referred to that also, I will mention that earlier later, but uh, also in Ghana. Supporting research communities, we have been working, providing an equitable price repository infrastructure, supporting strategic partners in the continent, and contributed through leadership and capacity building. And here's the staff around South Africa that Mark mentioned earlier. We have been providing quality, affordable data repository infrastructure to South African universities since 2019 via Tenet. Uh, Tenet is an NREN, part of the Ubuntu uh, Net Alliance that uh, Harold works with. Uh, a founding partner of the Ubuntu Net Alliance. And we've been working in a consortium with Tenet since 2020, um, providing this affordable data infrastructure to 17 institutions. Um, here's a page that you can go to where you will see as in the screenshot shows all the, all the different uh, institutions that contribute um, to the data repositories. And also, uh, as Mark mentioned, this community of 17 individual data repositories and growing because we have some in implementation, so they will be growing. They are sharing a wide range of research data outputs in all disciplines. And we have built an aggregated repository, which we call Discover Research from South Africa, that searches all the individual data repositories together, making South African research data more visible. And here it is, this is the screenshot. And he saw it earlier as well. So as well as that, we've been partnering with African Archives since early 2020 and being one of the established scholarly repository providers that contribute to African Archive. We will put this presentation in African Archive later, as Mark mentioned, and this is how our part of the African Archive repository looks like. And in May last year, we signed, Mark signed a partnership 
to promote data awareness and participation in Africa in collaboration with the African Library Information Associations and Institutions, AFLIA, which you are probably very familiar with, especially if you are librarians. So um, there is a QR code in there where you can read in the uh, website about the press release and how we are what we're trying to do with them. But uh, one of the main things that we're doing, um, we provided uh, a free conference repository, fix a repository for AFLIA, to put together um, the proceedings of the conferences. So this is how it looks like at the moment. And this is just uh, how it looks like in a screenshot. Um, the proceedings from last year are there, including my paper, I can see there. Uh, this is just a coincidence of the screenshot I took. Um, as well as doing the conference repository together, we are contributing thought leadership and capacity building, and we are planning and we will be delivering capacity building programs for librarians and repository managers on open data management, on persistent identifiers, the fair and care principles. And we are working also with Garlic, um, the association in, in Ghana, and other associations around um, Sub Saharan Africa. And we are also and have been supporting our partners with conference sponsorship. We've been, I've been mainly going and speaking and sharing conference sessions, um, doing workshops, webinars such as this one. And I just put in there some of the countries where we've been in the last 12 months or so. So we were in Botswana and Uganda for UbuntuNet. And we will be coming again this year, hopefully. Um, we've been in South Africa for the World Science Forum, for the UNESCO Open Day there, um, in national conferences in Ghana, in Zambia, in Uganda. So yes, contributing to partners, working together, supporting um, upskilling of librarians, supporting talking to others and learning what about what we can do to contribute um, together in the field. So I want to talk very briefly about percent, persistent identifiers because obviously that's the theme of all the webinars and how FIXER integrates with persistent, persistent identifiers to assure discoverability, discoverability by people and machines as uh, Mark had explained earlier. So three things I'm going to talk about, DOIs, which are obviously for research outputs and I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. Uh, ORCID for individual researchers and ROAR for research institutions. So FIXEA means it's data site DOI for its output. Um, you can see in there in a screenshot of how it looks like. Um, in FIXEA, we, we mint the DOI, but you are also able to choose uh, um, and upload a, a pre-existing DOI if you want to link the data that you have to a publication, for example, that might already have a DOI from the publisher. Um, you can also put a handle if you want. So this is just an example here. But yeah, the main takeaway is everything that you upload in Fixair is given a, a DOI um, to identify it. We also link with uh, our author profiles integrate with ORCID. So we also link with ORCID. And this is an example here using my own Fixia profile. So when you set up the profile, it asks you to connect and enable syncing with ORCID, uh, continuing with the, the screenshot. Once you do that, um, you are able to configure ORCID and it tells you um, whether you can, you can push data from ORCID to FIXER, the other way around, from FIXER to ORCID and create draft records from the ORCID data. The important bit, I have taken Mark's um, FIXER profile here and so how it's integrated with his ORCID and also displays user metrics and collaborators, which is very, very useful to identify for the people that he's working with. Um, and that is for all author profiles uh, that get created in Fixair. So even, you know, if you want to do a Fixair.com account, you can create one for free, as Mark has explained, and create your author profile integrated with your ORCID and, and pull and push things from there. Um, also, ROAR, Research Organization, 
registry. Um, Pro Pro started in 2019, and we've been working uh, with 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 Roar. Um, and also, I want to mention that um, all the Roar was funded as a community driven initiative. Um, it was mirroring the, the grid database, um, which was started in 2015 by Digital Science, our parent company. Um, so in 2015, Digital Sciences released the Global Research Identifier Database, GRID, which was an open database of unique research-related organizations identifiers. And that had been developed in-house over a number of years for public use by the research community. And then when Roar started, built on seed data from GRID, and it came off age and started being independent, then uh, Digital Sciences decided to, to pass on the button to, to Roar and, and stop doing greed uh, from the public space. And so the last release of, of, of greed was in 2021, at the end of 2021. And from then we have Roar. And in here, I have a screenshot of, of how Roar that works in the background uh, looks like. So I have put two rows in there from the metadata, from the taken from an API. And, and the point in there is, is the, the point that Mark was making about the machines, things that are not just findable and accessible to us as humans, but also interoperable and reusable by machines. The last thing I want to talk about before um, we finish, and I hand over to Mark again, is um, about Fixair building integrations and open tools. And the first one is the API that Fixair has and makes available to others. And then um, our built-in integrations with our sister companies, Dimensions and Allmetric. So Fixair plays very well with other systems. We have an openly documented API and we are also able to plug into discovery layers, preservation systems, create and ring systems, uh, um, GitHub, GitLab, uh, notebooks, lots of other systems. We do a lot of integrations, um, or people can do a lot of integrations, let's, let's say, um, using Fixair and their systems that they use in universities. We also provide, and this is very, very useful for researchers, use of metrics for discoverability. We use Dimensions Database, which is our sister company as well, to showcase views, downloads, and citations. And you have an example there of an item, how the item displays in Fixair and the user metrics in there. Um, citations um, appearing in Fixair are measured using data from Dimensions, as I said. Dimensions is a research information database. It's actually the, the research information database that indexes more data from more publications, as you said, from Africa and African researchers that any of the other databases you might be using and, and know of. And the data comes from the full test available from this database that has more than 80 million papers. And it comes from a number of sources, all the big uh, publishers, Excluding Springer Nature, Taylor Francis, Emerald. Um, and like most citation tracking tools, Dimension only tracks citations on DOIs. So that's why it's super important to have a DOI to start with. Fixair imports the citation data from Dimensions on a weekly basis. So um, sometimes um, it might be, it appears automatically, but it might be that um, you, you see a different citation number. Sometimes the, the, the import happens every week. And also it checks for um, citations that might not have been um, given to the, to the right, um, um, what am I trying to say? Um, <laughs> that it might be erroneous citations and removes them. So then, uh, so the count will change every week sometimes. Um, so then it will pull, if you click on the citation, it will pull the information directly from Dimensions and you can go into the Dimensions page. This is open access. It doesn't require any, uh, any account. 
uh, in its description, you just can go directly and see what publications have been cited in your paper. And the same um, with all metrics. All metrics are, al are alternative metrics, and we also use our sister company, Allmetric, to provide this integration that happens automatically, and it displays in Flixair. So all metric data appears on item pages where all metric has found the attention. Includes attention on social media, news outlets, patents, policy papers, and more. And again, the users can click, or anybody that is looking at Flixair can click on the all metric donut to see whether the items have received attention. And and they will be sent again to the old metric portal where you have more information and you can see the screenshot in there. So that's what, all I wanted to share. I just wanted to hand over back to Mark that is going to talk for a couple more minutes about what the future looks like before we open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I just wanted to, to, to finish with this concept of, you know, what, what there's a lot happening. Why is it important? And, and where do I think we're going? And I think, um, one of the things that is notable is that if you're running a university or you're running your own organization or you're a researcher in an organization, there's so many different tools, there's so many different things that you need to plug into. The nice thing is that you can usually use a single sign-on system and just log in with your user email, your university email and password. And I think for the repository space, it's bit, you might have had a a thesis and dissertation repository, a green open access paper repository, a data repository, uh, an open educational resources repository. And I think what we'll see is just having one system that as the technology is improved, if you can handle videos, you can handle PDFs, it's just files and metadata on the internet with persistent identifiers. The thing I'm really excited about from our side of things in the in the in the building the the repository space is can we use AI and machine learning to make things even easier for the researchers? If I upload a video, can the AI generative AI tell me what that video is showing me and fill in the form fill for me? Can it suggest better metadata that I'm using? And then um, for interoperability and workflows, you might have an institutional repository and you can pull out all, all of the data in a certain schema, maybe OAI PMH to pull into the national uh, repository. You wanna give them a feed of information, but they only can accept a different type of a feed. I think the generative AI can do that crosswalk of metadata schemas in the future. And then for us, I think the usability has to work for two sets of folks. It has to work for the researcher to make it as easy as possible. They're busy. They just need this simple solution uh, with some help from the admins, with some help from the librarians. But also we need to make tools that work well for the librarians. You can't have a nice fancy thing for the researchers. And then the back end when I'm trying to, you know, set it up as a, as a library or see the metrics for my internal presentation that I need to show my boss. We can't have the system looking bad there as well. So I think usability for both admins and, and users is always important for us. And then finally, I just want to talk on um, the final slide, which is uh, this one. What does the future look like? And I'm, I, I don't have the answer here. I'm just going to leave you with this. I mentioned that with data being made available, I feel that a lot of the low hanging fruit, uh, low hanging fruit in research has been grabbed, right? So how can we use the machines to think along with us and query all of the data and look for new trends um, to help us move further faster? But I, so I think the machines are gonna consume and generate new academic content. We're gonna help them do that. But we also need to clean it up. We also need good metadata. What I was saying before about is the metadata good enough? We have people using the free Figshare, trying to make their data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And they give the data set the title, data set. Your title should be as descriptive as possible. Think about how you'd write a title for a publication. Um, and so if you call your data set, data set, it's not findable. If you go to Google now and search for data set, I'm not gonna find your data set. 
you should give it the descriptive title the role of so and so and so and so and so and so in this um so i think we need to use the machines to help us curate and clean the academic content uh before the mission we start relying on the new information so i just wanted to leave that as a thought point i think uh africa has a great opportunity to build on top of the data that they are generating from the within your universities from within your institutions and uh i think it it leaves it's always good to leave food for thought so that's everything from us thank you harold yeah um thank you very much um mark and um and maria maybe before before we open it up to uh, the audience and and in the chat I've, I've seen uh one question in the chat um or actually two but before i open it up to them in the interest of time just quickly mark you mentioned uh something about africa being the most open uh continent or rather in, in your data is that something that you notice so just like two questions uh how does uh picture work alongside other similar services globally and particularly in africa uh, and also especially on the Africa being more open, uh, what are some features that have made Africa stand out as, as a user base compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, so um, great questions. I think there's, firstly, what I will say is in answer to the question about why is Africa in general more open than, say, Asia, and why is Ethiopia in particular the most open of all of the countries. As somebody who lives in England, I was hoping that somebody on the call may have more of a, a, an a idea than I will because it's all about that local knowledge. And I did, I spoke to somebody from Ethiopia recently and they mentioned, oh, we've got this new policy uh, from the government around open research. And it was like, oh, that's probably got a thing to do with it, right? So um, we always think there's, there's global and there's local infrastructure and you need both. So... When we talk about what we plug into, you mentioned, I see a question here as well, is where, where we get our uh, DOIs from. So we do get partner with uh, Datasite for our DOIs. I'm on the board at Datasite, so uh, very clued up with what's happening there. Um, but it's it's your DOIs, right? We mint them on your behalf, but you can take them with you if you move on to another system. The um, We also plug into ORCID. We plug into these raw, as Maria mentioned, these global things. But then there's also the local things as well. So uh, there is one area where we don't use data site DOA, DOIs we, in Japan. One organization we work with there, they have their own local DOIs. I know there's a movement for uh, an African PID system. If that gets established to a point where we can integrate with it, of course, we're going to integrate with that, right? Because there's this local and global infrastructure level. Um, but why? why uh researchers in africa tend to be more open is something that we can we can see in the um in the survey itself you know the do you think it would be good to have a funder mandate in your country um for open research and open data africa comes out high as i said ethiopia comes out a lot higher than say north america where they already have mandates so um I don't have the answer to why that is, because I think a lot of it is going to be local knowledge. And we only we only establish that by working locally with organizations and coming to the different organizations and going to conferences and speaking to people and them telling us what's happening. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's uh, that's that's very true. I think that's a fair point to make. I think platforms like this do provide a, also a good channel to try and discuss and try and find out why that is the case. Perhaps, like you said in your presentation, it's very important to take advantage of it um, rather than, uh, you know, dealing with why that's the case. That's also, you know, besides the point, perhaps. But uh, Maria, um, what are the goals that Fixshare seeks to achieve with regards to serving the African community in the year of uh, 2024? And also, uh, while you answer that, you should you should also go on to answer the question, how can the African community become more involved, which I think is something that is that is um um part of the question that um Mrs. Dorothy Enea has asked in the in the in the in the chat as well. But yeah, can you please expand more on that? Yes, thank you, Harold. So I have been in Fixer exactly two years. Tomorrow it will be two years actually. 
And as you say, Africa is, is one of the country, the territories where I work, not the only one. I, I work for FEXEA in all to expand all the global reach in, in territories where we haven't been before. But um, I've been working really hard to be seen, to, to be, be working in active and generally in collaboration and partnership with, with, with you colleagues in Africa. So that's why I've been going there. Um, contributing to conferences, um, always, you know, sponsoring if, if we can, but always contributing to conference, presenting papers, putting paper proposals forward, um, contributing to the thought leadership and listening as well, not just contributing by actively talking, but also listening, going there to observe who the players are, what the needs are, and I will continue doing that in 2024. So continue um creating relationships, trusted relationships. I've also been advocating a lot for um, for Africa in particular, um, around the barriers that I have seen and that others have told me um, are there in between, in between us for genuine collaboration and supporting policies to grow fix air in Africa. And, and I know affordability is a barrier, so we have created equitable pricing. So there's a structure that supports us with, with uh, prices where we build repositories um, for an equitable price in Africa. Um, I will continue, as I said, um, trying to listen to people. So what can the community do? is um, invite us to attend and support uh, conferences and events that you are holding, event, invite us to webinars like this, tell us what you your needs are and continue the dialogue. So I put our emails on the at the end of the presentation there for a while and um, somebody just says, you just answer my question. I don't know, I hope that's the question I, I am, but perhaps it's the question around where do we say this? But yeah, for me, it's very much about continuing the dialogue. Both Mark and I are, are here to, do, to listen as well as, as to talk and to understand more how can we contribute. As we mentioned, there is a very active community in South Africa. So also some of them are on the call and also I can see the names of other colleagues we are actively speaking to and working with in, in Ghana. And we will start tomorrow. I have a call uh, first thing in the morning with Ethiopia. So it's like talking to people, understanding what sort of repositories they need and what other support they need from us. So that's, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mark, I see you unmuted. Is there something you wanted to add? I was just going to say that, you know, we, we can all try as much as we can. Uh, uh, and it takes it takes a lot of work to be present as in as many places as you can be. Right. And so I saw somebody asking previously about like uh, how how the good thing about working in for, for a tech company is you can you can it doesn't matter where you are, right? As I tell my mom, we work on the internet, right? So I am in London, but uh, when we started doing work in South Africa, we hired local people in South Africa. We've got folks in Australia, we've got folks in North America. And I think it's gotta be this kind of like um, working locally to understand how the local, uh, the, in a particular country, what the rules are, what the regulations are, and having that local expertise. Uh, I think during COVID, uh, you know, I lost a lot of my knowledge of what was going on because I see people uh, on the call here in countries I've not yet been to. So as Maria was saying, we, we're always we're always happy to come and chat. Or uh, if you're ever in London, please do give us a shout. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. And just as well, we're almost out of time, but I think we can just add three minutes just to address the questions in the chat. But yes, Maria, definitely your your presence in Africa is actually felt, and I can attest to that as well because even last year you were one of the sponsors for the uh, the regional um, annual conference for Ubuntu Netherlands, where a lot of engagement was. So definitely your your presence is felt. Maybe just to go into the chat quickly. Um, yes, I said Mrs. Dorothy Nair asked. Uh, she needs more information on repository hosting. What conditions are required for a repository to be hosted by Figshare? So, Mrs. Dorothy should contact me, and we have uh, we can have a conversation personally. Um, we provide repositories for institutions, 
And we need to understand the needs, the type of institution, how big the institution is to be able to have a, a bigger conversation, the country where you are. And um, I will be very happy to speak to you. So if you are still on the call, uh, please feel free to email me at mariatfixia.com or I will try to find you. But uh, that is, we don't, we don't have a one size fits all. We, we build repositories for different institutions from national repositories to very small institutions, to research institutes, to all sorts. So I need to have a, a, a conversation with you on your requirements. Okay. Um, yeah. Th thank, thank you for that. And also, finally, uh, this is actually quite a, uh, several questions. Thank you very much, um, Teklewenni. I hope I got that correct. But she, um, has several questions. Who is responsible for assigning DOIs for fixed share repositories? I hope you keep up, uh, Maria or Mark. So that's the first one who is responsible for assigning DOIs. With whom is Fixture partner, Partnership data site or Crossref, which is pretty much the same question. Why Africa is more open than Japan? I think, uh, Mark, you covered that already. How Fixture planned to build capacity in research workflow in Africa, East Africa, and Ethiopia in particular? Um, so you want, you want to take that either, Mark or, or Maria? Yeah. I just want I just want to touch on it. Maria already mentioned she's got a call with Ethiopia tomorrow. We, we're always trying to build bridges. We're always trying to make friends. We're always trying to get to events, and 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 that's where it starts, right? We need to come and or we need to have a conversation with somebody who's local who understands what's going on. I want to give a, a big shout out to Tech uh, Tech Luani because if you don't know data sites already, it is fantastic not for profit not for profit uh, DOI infrastructure provider. We we mint DOIs on on behalf of organizations there, and uh, I'm sure uh, Tech Luani is a very uh, a very well con uh, networked person if they are working uh, volunteering at data site. So uh, we haven't met yet. I look forward to meeting you soon. Uh, Maria, anything to add on that? No, I think that uh, Mark has also mentioned um, the bit about uh, um, why Japan and Africa, uh, we, Mark has been working on the research. Uh, but actually the reasons why, I, I don't know exactly why. I, I, I think that we'll have to go to the countries to find out. Yeah, we'll find out. What I mean, it's hard to, you know, you can you can hypothesize and you can come up with ideas, but until you've got the facts, you don't know. My my uh I, I know that Japan has very strict rules on IP. It could be something that they're scared because they don't want to break any IP laws, but this is where training and education will it'll hinder them in the short term if they don't get educated on the benefits of open in the long term. Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the reasons could be so vast. You'd also have to look at things like culture and all those things. So I, I think, yeah, that is such a, a deeper question. But um, yes, I think with the interest of time, in order to avoid to go beyond time too much, uh, allow me to thank you, Maria and Mark. This was truly uh, a very educational webinar. And thank you so much for making the time. And um, I'm pretty sure that some conversations will also follow from this webinar. And also thank you to everybody who took the time to participate. I'm sure it was very educational. And um, I'm sure we'll also have you in the upcoming webinars in the webinar series. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you can you can you can be able to get the details of the webinar series um, on uh, Ebuka. Can you please post the link in the in the chat as well so that maybe people can follow that up? But it's available on the Africa Archive website. So yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next webinar session is on the seventh of March, um, with uh, Nokutu Nokutula Mchunu, yeah, of Africa Open uh, Science Platform (AOSP) yes, as as our guest speaker. So please plan to attend that seventh March, and um, yes, we will see you then. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a have a, a lovely uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.